Imagine a being so powerful it can suck in entire galaxies, so mysterious it's invisible to the naked eye, and so impressive it bends the very fabric of space and time to its will. Yes, meet my mother. Nah, just kidding. Actually, meet the ultimate superhero of the universe, the black hole star. What is it and how does it work? Well, let's find out. The universe is full of marvels, and the black hole star is one of the most impressive ones. It's a supermassive force that can bend the laws of physics and a true enigma for scientists to unravel. No wonder science fiction writers find them so captivating. A black hole star, also known as a quasi-star, is a hypothetical type of extremely massive and luminous star that may have existed early in the history of the galaxy. They're predicted to be as luminous as a small galaxy. But unlike modern stars, they weren't powered by nuclear fusion in their cores. A quasi-star's energy would come from material falling into a black hole at its core. And yes, just like a normal black hole, these stars have the power to suck in anything and everything that gets too close, including stars, dust, and even entire galaxies. But how is it possible that the star is born from a black hole? And what's more, how do they continue to coexist together? Well, first let's discuss how black holes are born in general. It all starts with a supermassive star, one that is at least a few times more massive than our own sun. This giant of a star burns bright and hot, shining with the light of a million suns. But eventually, it runs out of fuel and its fate is sealed. As its lifespan comes to an end, it makes one final massive boom. A blast so powerful it can outshine an entire galaxy. This blast is called supernova. During this boom, the outer layers of the star fly away, while the core gets squished together by its own gravity. If the squished core is heavy enough, it can keep squishing until it becomes a black hole. And just like that, a black hole is born. Don't even try to put diapers on this thing. Now, this cosmic monster baby can continue to grow by swallowing up anything that comes too close, including stars, dust, and even entire galaxies. This is basically what's happening now in our universe with supermassive stars. But what about quasi-stars? The formation of a quasi-star could only happen early in the development of the universe, before hydrogen and helium were contaminated by heavier elements. And because of that, quasi-stars have one important feature. They are gigantic, so enormous, that it's literally impossible to imagine. They may have been dwarfing even the largest known modern stars, like V.Y. Canis Majoris and Stevenson 218. No wonder they're so scary. They were born from protostars, one of the first stars in the universe. The great-great-grandfathers of, you know, everything. So now, imagine a protostar so massive that its core collapses into a black hole, just like we described before. But the key difference is that in a regular supernova, the outer layers of the star are blown away by the energy released during the boom. Meanwhile, in a quasi-star, these outer layers are massive enough to absorb the energy without being blown away. What do we get in the end? A star with a black hole in its core that weighs from 1,000 to 10,000 solar masses. This quasi-star is about 14,000 times bigger than our Sun, which makes them bigger than any star we know today. These celestial titans have some pretty crazy properties. Once a black hole is formed at the center of a giant protostar, it starts to give off a ton of energy. This energy helps to balance out the force of gravity, making it kind of a giant fusion-based star. They would be so bright that each one would look like a small galaxy. Quasi-stars would have a pretty short lifespan, around 7 million years. Just for comparison, our Sun is about 4.5 billion years old and it's only halfway through its lifetime. But either way, during this short period, the black hole at the center would grow to be about 1,000 to 10,000 times the size of our Sun. Quasi-stars are also thought to be super hot, with temperatures reaching over 17,500 degrees. But as a quasi-star gets older, it starts to cool down, and its outer layers become see-through. Eventually, it cools down to a temperature of 6,740 degrees. And at that point, it's curtains for the quasi-star. It can't survive at that temperature, so it just dissipates, 
leaving behind an intermediate mass black hole. Unfortunately, right now, there's no observational evidence for the existence of quasi-stars. This is because they're thought to have only existed a very, very long time ago. They may have been very massive population 3 stars, which are extremely rare and difficult to detect. It's also very unlikely that any of them would still exist today because of their super short lifespan – only 7 million years. So why do scientists believe that quasi-stars could have existed? Because they're looking for ways to explain how supermassive black holes formed so early in the history of the universe. They're found at the center of most galaxies. But how could these monsters have formed so quickly? After all, it takes a really long time for small black holes to grow into supermassive ones. This is where the idea of quasi-stars come in. These stars aren't just destructive forces of nature, they're like the black belts in the martial art of gravity. They can bend and twist anything to its will. That's why these stars, if they really existed, had to play a crucial role in the evolution of galaxies. They must have been instrumental in shaping the universe as we know it. So those intermediate-sized black holes that they left behind could eventually turn into supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. But we're still yet to solve this cosmic mystery. Detection and study of black hole stars is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Only instead of a needle, it's an invisible and mysterious object. And instead of a haystack, it's the vast expanse of space. But with the help of some pretty cool technology and a lot of brain power, scientists are getting closer to uncovering the secrets of these celestial giants. Here are some things that can help us in this research. First of all, gravitational waves. They're like ripples in the fabric of space-time, caused by the movement of massive objects. Albert Einstein predicted them way back in the 20th century, but they were finally detected only in 2015. We caught them by observing the collision of two black holes. This discovery confirmed that black holes can merge and that they're a powerful source of gravitational waves. Scientists think that by studying these waves, they can learn more about how black holes form and grow. We can also try to detect quasi-stars by observing the effects of their gravity on nearby objects. It's like trying to spot a criminal by their fingerprints. For example, if a black hole is located near a star, scientists can observe the star's light being distorted as it's pulled toward the black hole. And, of course, we can use our technologies, such as X-ray, infrared, and radio telescopes. This allows us to study black holes in various ways and at different stages of their lives. In other words, scientists are working hard to uncover the secrets of these celestial giants. We develop new telescopes, search for primordial black holes, and try to understand the connection between black hole stars and dark matter. And we're making some pretty incredible discoveries, just like with gravitational waves. All these things will bring us closer to uncovering the secrets of quasi-stars. And when we find out the truth about them, it will become a new page in our scientific history. Brace yourself. You're about to hear one of the most unusual sounds ever. It's come from space, and it's the sound of two black holes colliding. But first things first. Our ears are designed in a special way, which helps us translate sound waves. But these sound waves become mute once the medium they're traveling through comes to an end. It happens when, for example, the atmosphere of Earth gives way to the vastness and emptiness of the cosmos. At the same time, there are some sound waves that can move even through a vacuum. And we can translate these vacuum-friendly waves into sounds our human ears can hear. That's kind of like radio transmissions work. Over the past few decades, people have sent quite many satellites to the far reaches of the solar system and even beyond. These spacecraft are equipped with sensors designed to hear such things as radio and plasma waves flowing freely through interplanetary space. These instruments are crucial for research and communication reasons. An additional bonus is that now we can finally hear different kinds of space waves as audible sounds. The results are often ear-splitting sounds, and sometimes audios are downright scary. Usually, when two black holes collide, they don't produce a sound. And still, thanks to modern technologies, we can now listen to this terrifying cosmic event. Do you hear it? 
This chirping sound is the sound that two black holes produced while slamming into each other around a billion light years away from our planet. Interestingly, the tone of the sound rises when the holes spiral closer to each other and stops abruptly when they eventually merge. Now, do you hear that long, low buildup? It means that the merger is quite slow, more sedate, and the black holes taking part in this event are relatively lightweight. A more abrupt chirp is a sign of a fast merger, where the black holes are rather large. For example, the pair that produced this sound combined and created one black hole more than 80 times the mass of the sun. Since each of these black holes weighed as much as several stars, they were hefty enough to produce waves while passing through space. I mean gravitational waves. They are undulations in the fabric of space-time, fanning outward at the speed of light. You can probably compare them to the ripples that appear on the surface of a pond after you throw a rock in the water. Naturally, the sound of black holes colliding isn't the only unusual noise recorded by our equipment. NASA's Juno probe passes by Jupiter every few weeks at a speed of up to 130 miles per hour and plows through all kinds of invisible fields in the process. And one of the most powerful signals it has recorded is Jupiter's bow shock. That's the point where the planet's magnetic field pushes against the incoming wind of solar particles. The sound produced during this standoff sounds similar to a sonic boom. Or this sound. It was produced by the Stardust space probe when it was passing through the dust left by comet Temple 1. In the process, debris hit the body of the spacecraft. It sounded as if some creature was rapping at the window or hurrying across a hard floor. Let's have a look at NASA's nuclear-powered Cassini spaceship. It spent 13 years exploring gas giant Saturn and its numerous potentially habitable moons. This mysterious and a bit spooky sound is actually radio waves emitted by the massive planet. Such waves are caused by a phenomenon which is similar to the one producing auroras on Earth. Speaking of our own planet, it's surrounded by plasma. It consists of hot, ionized particles generated by sunlight. They're constantly slamming into Earth's atmosphere. NASA's polar mission, which was launched a few decades ago, managed to record this breath-like hiss. That's what plasma orbiting our planet sounds like. As for these weird sounds, NASA doesn't say which space probe recorded them, but they're coming from Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede. It could have been the Galileo spacecraft, which orbited the system for around eight years. But it probably doesn't matter so much. Just listen to this creepy noise that sounds like screams trying to break through from some hidden place. Check this out. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet they're calling Super Saturn. It's got rings over an AU wide. An AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun to the Earth. That's an incredibly huge ring system, hence its name. Super Saturn is being called Mamajek's object after the astronomer who led the team to whom we owe the discovery. Professor Eric Mamajek of Rochester University in New York found Super Saturn while scouring through data downloaded from wide-angle transit observations. WASP is the acronym for Wide Angle Search for Exoplanets. It's an ingenious project developed in the year 2000 by astronomers at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland and St. Andrews University in Scotland. Using four telescopes, the CCD video cameras on the scopes record the slight dimming of starlight caused by objects passing in front of stars. This is called the transit method of exoplanet detection. 
So, for example, the planet Venus transits across our view of the Sun every couple hundred years. A black dot, the silhouette of Venus, is visible, crossing in front of the Sun as Venus passes between our line of sight and the Sun. This tiny eclipse causes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth to be reduced by a minuscule amount, also known as teeny tiny. The same is true for all the stars in the Milky Way that have planets going around them. Exoplanetary transits in front of stars must be in direct line of sight with Earth for the starlight to be dim. Such transits do not occur very often. That's why thousands of stars must be looked at simultaneously for as long of a duration as possible, between 4 and 8 hours a night. WASP was created to stare continuously at as wide of a range of stars as possible. Maybe one of them would show an exoplanet transit. That translates into a lot of data being produced, about 40 gigabytes per viewing session. Computer scientists at Leicester University in England developed a computer program to store the data and generate photometric graphs of the light intensity of each star. Open University, also in England, joined the WASP project, took this data, and made it available for research by astronomers worldwide. The graphs of the intensity of starlight show that changes in its brightness are called light curves. These graphs have two axes. One is in the timeline axis, the other one is the intensity of light. As the object, considered an exoplanet, though it could also be a brown dwarf star, crosses in front of the star, the timeline axis keeps track of how swiftly it is moving. It tells us how close the object is to the star, while the brightness axis keeps track of how much the starlight dims. This way, we can find out how large the object is. Now, obviously, big objects will dim the light more and be easier to detect. At present, Earth-based equipment is not sensitive enough to measure the dimming caused by planets as small as Earth. Neptune's size and larger ones are the limit for WASP. However, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in operation, has a much greater sensitivity and will be able to resolve the transits of Earth-sized exoplanets. Now, I know you want me to get to Super Saturn, but there's something else you should be familiar with before we get there. If the exoplanet has an atmosphere, or in the case of Super Saturn, a ring system, the starlight from the star the planet is transiting will shine through the atmosphere or ring system, and that can be detected too. The light curve will show less dimming in the photometric data, because not all the starlight is being blocked. Some light is still getting through the atmosphere or rings. This is important because it gives astronomers a reading of the atmosphere. back to Super Saturn. 
The star that Super Saturn orbits is J1407, a small, dim, sun-like pre-main sequence star of the 13th magnitude. Huh? Well, the human eye can only see stars to about the 6th magnitude, and each magnitude is two and a half times dimmer than the previous one. So it's not an exceptional star, just another telescopic star out there in the Scorpius Centaur region of the night sky. J1407 is a young star that hasn't yet settled into its stable, long-duration phase. This is important because Super Saturn, officially J1407b, is showing signs of having a ring system in an early stage of development. Super Saturn's light curve was tucked away in the mountain of data from the Super Wasp project. Professor Eric Mamajak and his associate, Matthew Kenworthy of Leicester University, studied the data thoroughly and produced a detailed report on it. Knowledge depends on good data. The horizontal axis of J1407b's light curve, the time axis, is what's causing all the hubbub. It took Super Saturn weeks to transit across in front of its parent star. 56 days, to be exact. Planetary ring systems that we are familiar with in our solar system orbit right around the equators of the gas giant planets and are very thin, from only a few meters thick down to a few centimeters. In a telescope, Saturn's rings will seem to disappear when the planet is at zero inclination toward Earth. Saturn must be inclined at an angle in relation to Earth to see Saturn's beautiful ring system. It's something everyone should make a point of seeing. Saturn in a telescope. If Super Saturn's rings block most of the light from J1407 for 56 days, it means that the planet had to be orbiting at a steep inclination to its star. If it were at zero inclination, we wouldn't see the rings blocking any light. Therefore, the orbital time could be determined 10 years minimum to 200 years if the orbit is highly elliptical. The superplanet itself is calculated to be 24 times the mass of Jupiter, which means that if it is gaseous, it could be a brown dwarf star. Super Saturn appears to have a Mars-sized object orbiting around it, because there is a huge gap in the rings that was most probably cleared out by a large object. The Cassini division in the rings of Saturn is where the moon Mimas has cleared out a path through Saturn's rings. The light curve of Super Saturn has only been observed once. All the exoplanet detection systems are keeping an eye out for it to come back around J1407. No one knows when that will occur. Some astronomers have suggested that J1407b is a brown dwarf star system in itself, merely passing in front of, but not connected to, star J1407. An orbital reappearance of Super Saturn would disprove that conjecture. The center region of Super Saturn blocked out all the light from its primary star. This is what indicates that the ring system is new and in an early developmental phase. Over time, the very dense ring mass close to the planet is expected to thin as all this matter gets absorbed into the planet or ejected into space. This is what has happened with our solar system's gas giant planets. The Mamajek object is a shocker. Never before or since has a light curve been detected like Super Saturn's. Super Saturn has added a new chapter to our understanding of the formation of ring systems. So, here's to you, Super Saturn. Hope to see you again soon.
That's where the idea of planetary intelligence comes in. Just like individuals and groups can be intelligent, so can an entire planet. Researchers believe we should measure the planet's intelligence by its ability to keep itself going forever. And just like how humans need to work together to survive, a planet's collective intelligence is measured by the capacity of all the life on it to work together towards this same goal. It's like the planet is a complex system that knows how to take care of itself. Like forests, they can share nutrients through their secret underground networks of fungi. This helps all the trees stay healthy. We can obviously learn a lot from forests. If we jump into the fantasy universe while looking for intelligent, conscious planets, we definitely choose Mogo from Green Lantern. It's a specific planetary entity that can do things like changing its weather and altering gravity, plant growth, or some other surface conditions. Or how about the stunning Pandora from Avatar? Do you remember the fascinating scenes of flora and fauna there? With organs that might remind you of tentacles, they enable creatures to interlink with each other on a neural level. It's like the entire planet is like one giant brain with many smaller trees, creatures, and its other pieces as its cells. We're far from that, but it's still nice to imagine. At the moment, our civilization is in the stage scientists named an immature technosphere. That means we're still too focused on using technology that doesn't always do good for our planet. We don't have a planetary intelligence or a collective understanding of what needs to be done to do better for our planet. Instead, we're all just doing our own thing. I mean, we're not at the worst stage. Researchers have come up with four stages of Earth's past and future to explain how planetary intelligence could impact the long-term future of humanity. The first stage is what we call the immature biosphere. It's when life first started on Earth, billions of years ago. Only microbes were there on the bare land without any vegetation. There wasn't any global feedback, which means these microbes couldn't yet affect Earth, its atmosphere, or other systems in any way. The second stage is the mature biosphere, which was 2.5 billion to 540 million years ago, when stable continents formed and the biosphere started to have a strong influence on the Earth. The third stage, known as immature technosphere, is where we are now with interlinked systems of communication, technology, transportation, electricity, and computers that draw resources from Earth's systems and affect the biosphere. The fourth stage, also known as the mature technosphere, is where Earth should aim to be in the future. It means technology will benefit the entire planet. We'll use sustainable forms of energy, like solar power. Planetary intelligence is the sign of a mature planet and researchers are trying to figure out how we can move towards it. So things we do on an individual level do matter. The collective activity of life, like microbes or plants, can change a planet and make it more than just a lifeless rock floating in space. Through the biosphere, our home planet kind of figured out how to host life by itself billions of years ago, and it's still going. Now we need to figure out how to have a similar kind of self-maintaining system, but this time with the technosphere. It's hard to imagine planets could generally become sentient, like Pandora, or some other imaginary conscious world out there. There are a few reasons for that. First, planets form based on how different materials like rocks, gases, and liquids gather around a new star. It's like you have a big family gathering where everyone brings different ingredients to make a delicious dish. And just like how these ingredients won't suddenly turn into a living being, the materials that make up a planet won't just turn into self-aware creatures. On Earth, after billions of years of complex chemical reactions, some molecules started to replicate themselves and carry information. That's how life on our planet began. And Earth is the only such example we have. Here's the second reason. Imagine you have a big garden where you plant a lot of mushrooms or bacteria, hoping they'll become really smart and help you take care of the garden. But mushrooms and bacteria don't have brains like we do. Eh, it's not like they need it anyway. Having a big brain is really expensive for animals too. 
It takes a lot of energy to keep it running. So, animals only become as smart as they need to be to survive and thrive in their environment. Dogs and cats are pretty smart because they need to be able to avoid danger and find food. They don't need human kind of intelligence for things like building houses, creating art, or inventing new technologies. So, it would be hard to bring all living beings and plants to the same level of intelligence. The third reason why it would be difficult for a planet to become sentient is the main rule of the animal kingdom. Life is all about survival of the fittest. Every creature is competing for resources, like water, food, and space. But not only do different species compete against each other, but individuals within the same species also fight. Just think of how fiddler crabs fight for territory on the beach, or how wolf packs fight over prey. Or me, when I see an empty spot on a crowded beach. This kind of competition is not a good base for global cooperation. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, ants. They may not be the brightest creatures on the planet, but when they come together in colonies, they can achieve amazing things, like gathering food that's way bigger than them, building nests, raising young, and even farming. In fact, they act like a super organism called a hive mind, where every ant works together towards a common goal. Insects like bees and ants are very altruistic and work together to ensure their queen reproduces. If one large ant colony took over our whole planet, it could act as a single mind and work towards the colony's and planet's interests until they run out of resources. But in reality, it's hard to imagine any organism, even a superorganism, could reach such a level of self-awareness and consciousness. Number 5. How could we keep in contact? When it comes to communication, ants use pheromones and humans use nerves. Both of these methods work well for small organisms, but when it comes to a giant planet-sized entity, it would be hard to make such communication fast and efficient. So, communication within a planet-sized entity would be much slower than what we have in our homes, like our computers or smartphones. Oh well, we'll just continue dreaming about Pandora. If you somehow fell into a black hole, it might change your future and erase your past. Well, at least theoretically. Let's start with the real world we live in. Here on planet Earth, your past can definitely define your future. But imagine you're not on Earth, but somewhere out there in the endless universe, and you stumble upon a certain type of black hole. The one hmm. that a UC Berkeley mathematician found. Not to mix it with a regular black hole, let's call this type... What about a benign black hole, huh? So here's why you need a specific black hole. Thing is, you're highly unlikely to stay alive in a regular black hole. But according to some calculations made by a postdoctoral fellow, hints from UC Berkeley, this specific type of black holes we agree to call benign ones might expand at an accelerating rate. This is what makes it possible to survive the transition from our deterministic world to a black hole, which is not deterministic. Hmm. Let's imagine you survived that passage and now you're moving towards the center of a benign black hole. It's impossible to picture what's inside. And if you, as a traveler, could actually get into a black hole, you'd never be able to communicate to the outer world what interesting things are hidden in it. But it's not what interests us for now. We need to know how to get rid of the past. Hence, the mathematician you already know studies non-rotating black holes that have an electric charge. The most important thing about them is that besides the event horizon, they also have the Kochi horizon. And here's the point. The Kochi horizon is the place where so-called determinism simply breaks down. This may sound too scientific, but let me explain it to you. The Kochi horizon is the place where your past doesn't determine your future any longer. So, here's a mathematically proven and apparently working method of how to get rid of your past. All you need to do is get into space, find a specific black hole, make it to the center, and get to the Kochi horizon. However, if it sounds too complicated, you can simply try not to make mistakes here on Earth.
Yeah, ideas like your past gets canceled. You have an infinite amount of options of how your future will evolve. And all that jazz sounds as unrealistic as they are appealing. Like, imagine no one knows you failed to get into college and get a degree, but from now on, you have every opportunity to do whatever you want, but only theoretically. In reality, once you get into the black hole, not that specific one we've already talked about, you're most likely to disappear once and for all. But hey, don't be sad. I'm only talking about your current physical form. It's a bit deeper than it might seem. Thing is, there's a curious principle of quantum mechanics that can be explained in a simple way. For starters, imagine that you're not a human being, but just information. You have your experience, your background, and your thoughts. All of these are the information you are. Now, let's make it even simpler. Imagine a USB drive or a book. Both of these things contain information. If you smash a USB drive that contains music and movies, it won't exist anymore in its physical form, but the information it had will never stop existing. Same with the book. If you burn it, the information it has doesn't get burned. It continues to exist, but in another form. So, this fun theory claims that even though someone passes the horizon of events, which is a point of no return before you get spaghettified, they don't stop existing. In simple words, these universe travelers still exist, but in the form of information. Now, let's go back to the black holes. According to Stephen Hawking, black holes emit radiation. Radiation makes them shrink, and with time, I mean much time, a black hole can shrink so much that it eventually disappears. So what happens to the astronaut who got entangled in a black hole if it disappears? Nope, they won't be ejected from the black hole in the way they used to exist. However, they will still be ejected from there, but in the form of parking radiation. But it's just a theory. Right, you remember that no one knows exactly what happens in the black hole? Another theory says that what happens in the black hole doesn't really stay in the black hole. Sounds like a good alternative to Las Vegas if all the flights for the weekends have been booked. Some scientists believe that a black hole might have a portal where you can turn back time. According to this theory, there's a white hole at the end of a black hole. If you get there, you can undo things. Like you broke your mom's favorite vase? Hop into the white hole and it'll be as good as new there. You cooked a scramble and made a fresh orange juice, but somehow lost your appetite. It's not a problem if you cook it inside a white hole. Voila! The eggs are unbroken. The oranges are uncut and juicy again. No more food waste. All right, turning back time sounds really cool. So I guess we might actually need a black hole to help us out. If a black hole was made in a, let's say, lab, it could devour things until it grew big enough to consume the entire planet. First, it would munch on the Large Hadron Collider, which might possibly create something similar to a black hole here on Earth. Next, Geneva, where the Large Hadron Collider is located. Then the whole country of Switzerland, then Europe. At that point, it wouldn't be long before the Earth was gone too. Luckily, if a black hole did appear, it would be so small that it wouldn't be able to do anything. Black holes actually produce a lot of energy and release it, often as heat, like a furnace. That means they will fade away when they run out of fuel. Even if a stable microscopic black hole was created, it would grow so slowly that nothing would happen. Assuming that it survived long enough to absorb the tiny particles around it, a black hole of this size would take super long to get even a pound of weight. I won't be around then, but a black hole on Earth could be a great thing. Even a relatively small one may emit enough energy to completely power humanity. We're talking a lot about food, huh? Let's not forget about spaghettification. The concept is quite simple, by the way. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're playing with chewing gum. With your force, you could easily stretch it so instead of a regular piece, you can get a long and thin one. The same happens to you black hole force is enough to stretch you as if you were a piece of chewing gum. Gravity holds you tight on one side, which makes you stretch. You may wonder, how come you don't get spaghettified on Earth if there's gravity too? Easy peasy, it's just too weak to do that with you. If you asked a butterfly to stretch the gum, would it be able to do that? 
Not likely, their tiny limbs are just too weak. Same here, the Earth is just too weak compared to a black hole. So if you are wondering whether you'll ever reach six foot six, it may never happen on Earth. But once you're in a black hole, you can go far beyond those mere six foot six inches. Your best height moment won't last long though. If you stretch the chewing gum at one moment, it will simply tear apart. The same will happen to you because of spaghettification. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Verita Fort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit Crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario, but the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. 
The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice. The rings of Saturn.
They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, Some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D-ring. It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better, but then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit, because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. Now think about building a base on a space object. But your best friend lands on another one a few miles away. Then a giant icicle crashes into his rock and increases its speed. And a few days later, your friend is too far away. And it happens all the time. The only way to change your life is to settle on one of Saturn's moons. The planet has 83 of them. 
people have already confirmed and named 63, and the existence of 20 others has yet to be confirmed. They're all like different worlds. Some of them may be habitable, and the best candidate among them is Titan. There may be water on it, and its atmospheric pressure is only one and a half times greater than Earth's. Its atmosphere consists of nitrogen and a little methane, forming carbon smog in Titan's upper layers. For this reason, we can't study this moon from Earth. But the coolest thing is that Titan flies outside the rings of Saturn. This means people can lead a quiet life there. There's also satellite Phoebe, covered with craters like our moon. This giant celestial body looks more like a gigantic meteorite. People have a lot of choices of where to start a new life. During a couple of hundred years spent on ships near Saturn, humanity would learn everything about its satellites. But why did they try to live on the rings? Why didn't they land on one of the moons from the very beginning? Because, well, then this video would be less fun and a whole lot shorter. But what if we were initially born inside the rings of Saturn? Let's say a massive meteorite with frozen water got caught by the planet's gravity. There were the simplest life forms inside the ice. And then this life began to acquire more developed forms. Imagine that the large rock managed to remain untouched for hundreds of millions of years. And during this time, humans appeared. But of course, they would be very different there. Firstly, they wouldn't experience gravitational forces. This would make them taller, but weaker. People's skin would be pale because of the lack of light, but very hardy thanks to cold temperatures. Particles of ice and grains of sand flying in space would roughen people's skin. In such biological armor, without gravity, they would jump from one rock to another in search of food and water. And by the way, that would be the main problem. How would people survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space? Where would they get their food? Saturn's rings are a pretty lifeless and dangerous place. If there are not even the simplest forms of life there, then how could such a complex one as the human appear? Therefore, even in theory, the appearance of people would be impossible there. Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah, turns out it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season, and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. Now let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. 
A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the Collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow. Mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice. But these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. Several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry. Observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. 
As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes, and even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future, but right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity, and they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence? The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle, and then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought, because now scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon, and made of nickel and solid iron. It's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. 
a random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles? They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water, pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth 
is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds. You might think falling into a black hole is as easy as falling into a giant pit. But boy, is it a whole different ballgame. To actually fall into a black hole, you would need some incredible luck and a dash of wizardry. Moreover, if you were watching something fall into a black hole, you wouldn't even see it. Why? Well, let's try to understand the magic of physics. Falling into a black hole is really, really tricky. First of all, to even have a chance of doing this, you would need to aim perfectly and start your journey from very far away. It's like trying to hit a tiny target from a long distance. That's because black holes exist within galaxies, which are filled with other objects like stars, planets, and gas clouds. These objects have their own gravitational forces that can influence the path you need to take. It's like you have to carefully navigate through the room, avoiding bumping into others or getting pulled off course by their movements. In a similar way, when falling into a black hole, you need to navigate through the influences of other celestial objects. As you get closer, things get even more complicated. Making even the tiniest change in direction would require a tremendous amount of energy that you wouldn't be able to generate. It's like trying to steer a spaceship with no fuel left. This is because the black hole's gravitational pull is immensely strong. Once you pass the point called the event horizon, there is no coming back. You wouldn't be able to control anything. Now, even if you somehow manage to get on the right path and avoid all the obstacles, there's still a dangerous situation waiting for you. The intense heat and energy around the black hole, called plasma, would fry you as you get closer. So, you would need some impossibly strong protection to get even close to it. But not only is it nearly impossible to fall into a black hole, it's also impossible to see someone falling in it. Why? Let's find out. Imagine you're standing far away from a black hole, watching something getting closer and closer to the event horizon. As this thing, let's say it's a spaceship, falls into the black hole, two very strange things start happening. First, the color of the spaceship will change. You see, the gravity near a black hole is incredibly strong, much stronger than anything we experience here on Earth. This intense gravity affects everything around it, including light. Now, light has this fascinating property where it carries energy. But when light gets close to a black hole, the powerful gravitational pull starts sapping away its energy. Kinda like stealing it, making light weaker. And you know how when you look at a beautiful sunset, the sun appears to be this warm reddish-orange color? Well, that's because when sunlight travels through our atmosphere, it scatters and loses some of its higher energy bluish colors, leaving behind the redder ones. So when light loses energy, it tends to shift towards the red end of the color spectrum. The same thing happens near a black hole. The light from the spaceship loses energy due to the black hole's strong gravity. So the spaceship, which initially had its own color, starts looking redder and redder as it gets closer to the black hole. It's as if the black hole is casting its magical spell, changing the color of the spaceship itself. The second weird thing is related to time. According to a theory of general relativity, gravity can mess around with time itself. And it works in a very strange way, because none of you, not you, not people on board a spaceship, will feel this change. For you, an observer in this scenario, time is flowing just like it always does. You're just sitting there, sipping your space lemonade and watching the spaceship's journey. For people on a spaceship, things are the same. Their watch ticks away at a regular pace, and they go about their day as usual. But, objectively, for you, it would be like watching a spaceship fall in slow motion. It will seem to you that it's been falling into a black hole for weeks or even years. 
you might turn 80 and the spaceship is still out there. Crazy, right? Now, if time slows down for the spaceship, it means the light it emits also slows down. So imagine someone on that spaceship flicking a flashlight on and off. But because time is moving so slowly, the light coming from the flashlight also moves in slow motion. It takes ages for each burst of light to reach your eyes. You'll be watching a spaceship as if you're watching a video in super slow motion. And when light takes longer to reach your eyes, it becomes weaker and dimmer, just like a fading star. So as the spaceship gets closer and closer to the black hole's event horizon, not only does it start looking redder, but it also appears dimmer. So it becomes harder and harder to see the spaceship as it gets closer to the black hole. It slowly fades away, like a disappearing act on the grandest stage of the universe. Pretty mind-boggling, isn't it? But that's all about you, the observer. And how are people on board doing? What do you actually experience when you fall into a black hole? As you get closer to the black hole, something really weird starts happening. The gravity near the black hole is so powerful that it stretches and warps everything around it. So the difference in gravitational pull between your head and feet becomes significant. This difference creates a tidal force, which stretches your body like a long, thin shape. It's a process that's scientifically called spaghettification. Essentially, you would be stretched into a human noodle. Being turned into spaghetti might sound fun for a pasta lover, but it's definitely not so great for an astronaut. Meanwhile, colors around you begin to warp and distort, creating a dazzling light show. It's like riding a roller coaster through a rainbow tunnel twists and turns, flashes and sparks. It's an exhilarating, mind-bending experience. And then what happens to you depends on the type of black hole. First, we have classical black holes. These are black holes that exist forever. If you fall into this black hole, it would take an incredibly long time to reach the center. The center would keep getting closer and closer, but you would need an almost infinite amount of time to reach it so it would feel like your journey would never end. And then we have evaporating black holes. These black holes can evaporate over time due to a process called Hawking radiation. It's just like the ice cubes melting away. These black holes have a limited lifespan, and it's basically impossible to fall into one of them. As you approach the evaporating black hole, you find yourself hovering near its edge, the event horizon. It's like being stuck at the entrance of a super cool amusement park. But guess what? This amusement park is shrinking. The black hole is evaporating, and as it does, the event horizon gets smaller and smaller. So you stay right at the edge, tracking its every move, but you will forever stay in this event horizon without ever crossing it. But remember, once you pass the point of no return, there's no way back. You're on a one-way ticket to the mysterious heart of the black hole, the Singularity. At the Singularity, everything goes bonkers. Our current understanding of physics goes haywire, so it's a bit like entering a magic show. What happens once you reach the Singularity? Is there anything on the other side of a black hole? We have no idea. It's a big mystery for us, but maybe we'll figure this out someday. So my friend, it's best to admire black holes from a safe distance and let your imagination soar with the incredible wonders they hold. Just remember to keep your pasta on your plate and not near these cosmic spaghetti makers. Black holes are terrifyingly dense space objects, pulling inside everything that comes too close. Nothing can escape their clutches, even a beam of light. At the same time, black holes are some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. According to their mass, black holes are usually divided into three categories. Stellar black holes have a mass from a few to hundreds of times the mass of the Sun. Intermediate black holes should range from 100 to hundreds of thousands of times the Sun's mass. Scientists are now actively hunting these missing link black mysteries. But the real behemoths of the cosmos are supermassive black holes. They have hundreds of thousands to billions of times the mass of our Sun. Most supermassive black holes lie in the centers of their home galaxies. You can probably say that they sit in the gravitational driving seat, 
Meanwhile, hundreds of billions of stars, planets, and moons orbit them. Let's have a look at the biggest black holes astronomers have found so far. NGC 6166 is a monster that has grown to have a mass of 30 billion solar masses. It's actually an elliptical galaxy that has an active nucleus in the center. It's also one of the most luminous sources of X-rays. The galaxy's supermassive black hole powers two symmetric radio jets in the opposite direction, which is the result of the infall of gas into its center. Another peculiar thing about NGC 6166 is that it shows a blue shift, which means it's moving toward us. The next supermassive black hole is located in the constellation of Draco, approximately 10.4 gigalight years from us. The mass of this supergiant is more than 30 billion solar masses. Besides being incredibly massive, the black hole is also really big. If it replaced our sun, the diameter of this hole would extend to the orbit of Pluto. This S5 1481 is one of the most interesting black holes on our list. It has a mass of 40 billion solar masses and is actually a blazer, the most energetic of all quasars, which are super bright distant objects. The blazar's luminosity is 300 trillion times that of the sun and more than 25,000 times as great as the luminosity of all 100 to 400 billion stars of the Milky Way galaxy combined. But since the distance to this quasar is about 12.1 billion light years, we can't see it directly. But we know that the central black hole of the quasar consumes huge amounts of matter, about 4,000 solar masses of material every year. Phi C1101 is a supergiant elliptical galaxy. It's the most massive known galaxy so far. Since this galaxy is elliptical, it isn't filled with gas. That's why the star formation in that region is very low. As for the black hole at the center of IC 1101, it has a mass of 40 to 100 billion solar masses and emits clear radio signals. Recently, astronomers have discovered a gravitational space wonder that has swollen to really unimaginable proportions. The black hole I'm talking about is Ton 618, and it's a mind-boggling 66 billion solar masses. The thing is so massive that astronomers had to think of a new term to describe it. They came up with an ultra-massive black hole. Imagine gathering all the stars in our home Milky Way galaxy and squishing the matter they're made of into one black hole. And it still won't be enough to create a ton 618. If this monster of a black hole replaced the sun, its radius would be more than 40 times the size of Neptune's orbit. You probably know that black holes are made of matter packed together as densely as possible. And still, it doesn't mean that black holes are some kind of space predator, roaming galaxies and munching on everything they come across. Ton 618 still has a whole galaxy filled with stars and other stuff happily orbiting it without getting pulled inside. What I want to say is that the perception of black holes as giant vacuum cleaners is wrong. In reality, it's incredibly hard to grow a black hole Try to do it and you'll see. How about going deep, deep into the past? To the times before humans existed, before the infamous asteroid hit Earth, wiping off three-fourths of life forms on the planet, even before the sun ignited or galaxies appeared in the darkness of the cosmos. So, before light could even shine, there was the Big Bang. It happened 13.8 billion years ago. But what was before that? Some scientists are sure that there was no before. Time started ticking as soon as the Big Bang occurred. We're unlikely to ever figure out what reality was like before that, if any. This is beyond human understanding. But there are those who disagree. Some unconventional scientists theorize that just a moment before the Big Bang, all the energy and mass of the nascent universe could be compacted into an insanely dense but still finite speck. Let's imagine it as a seed of a new universe. And this seed, a chunk of essential material, compressed and hidden in a protective shell, was created nowhere else but inside a black hole. Black holes spin, incredibly fast, probably close to the speed of light. 
Such a spin can give the tightly compacted seed a ginormous amount of torsion. So the seed isn't just tiny and extra heavy, it's also compressed and twisted, which means that it can suddenly unspring with a big bang. Now, let's say you add up the energy and mass of all the particles the visible universe contains. And then, you try to figure out the answer to the following question. How big could the event horizon of a black hole with the same mass be? The event horizon is the point of no return. Once you cross this invisible line, there's no way back, even for light. But let's get back to our question. Shockingly, such an event horizon would be very close in size to the actual horizon of the observable universe. There's also this idea that became well known thanks to Stephen Hawking. According to it, every time a black hole appears in our universe, it probably gives rise to a baby universe. But you would only be able to visit such a universe if you crossed the event horizon and plunged inside the black hole. And as you know, once you did it, you wouldn't be able to return. In other words, right now, we might be living in a baby universe. But if some outsider is observing us at the moment, our world looks to them like a regular black hole. So in short, there could be a very old mother universe that forged a seed inside a black hole. This seed had its big bounce all those billions of years ago, and as a result, our universe came into existence. But even though since then it has kept growing and expanding, we might still be hidden behind the event horizon of our home black hole. There's also another idea. According to string theory, there's a multiverse of universes. Imagine our universe as a soap bubble. This bubble keeps expanding, and we live on its surface. String theory claims that our bubble isn't unique. There might be other bubbles out there. And all these bubbles move around, collide, sprout, or bud baby bubbles. In short, live their life. If we follow this theory, we might suppose that black holes are one-way doors between universes. And if you accidentally tumbled down the black hole in our home Milky Way galaxy, you'd end up in another universe. Or rather, not you, but what's left of you after falling through the insane weirdness of the black hole. In this case, this second universe wouldn't be inside ours. It would exist separately, and the black hole would merely be the link connecting them, like a shared route between two aspen trees. Whatever the truth, the danger is still there, lurking in the shadows. What if the black hole we live in decides to collapse? What if it pulls us deeper inside? Or if our world is just a bubble among trillions of other bubbles? What if it bursts one day? The protective shield of our planet decays and eventually fails. So do our satellites. First, communication satellites in the highest orbits go down. Next, astronauts in low Earth orbit can no longer contact their mission control center. And finally, hazardous, relentless cosmic rays start bombarding everything on Earth, causing havoc and devastation. Are these the terrifying consequences of the planet's magnetic field reversal we're going to face? Right now, as you're watching this video, Earth's north magnetic pole is extremely out of whack. It's so serious that scientists will have to update the global magnetic field model released a mere four years ago. Does it all mean that the magnetic pole of our planet will flip soon? Well, be patient, we'll figure it out a bit later. You see, the magnetic pole is moving quite erratically from the Canadian Arctic towards Siberia. And these movements are very unpredictable. But it's normal for the pole to be moving. There are long-term records from London and Paris that prove that the North Magnetic Pole moves randomly around the rotational North Pole over periods of several hundred years. But the most astonishing thing about its movement is that it's speeding up. Around the mid-1990s, the magnetic pole unexpectedly accelerated from a bit over 9 miles to 34 miles a year. And recently, the pole crossed the international dateline, moving toward the eastern hemisphere. The European Space Agency launched extremely accurate magnetic field satellites in 2013. Thanks to them, researchers have superb data they can use not only to make magnetic field maps, but also to update them every 6 to 12 months. That's how they were able to notice that the core field was weakening, too. It might be a sign that the planet's magnetic field is about to flip. To understand this process better, we need to figure out how the core field works. Let's say we've got a bar magnet that runs through the center of our planet 
and has a north and a south pole. This magnet is incredibly strong, representing about 75% of the intensity of our planet's magnetic field at the surface. Our bar magnet is not only moving, but is also getting weaker, by about 7% every century. Admittedly, this bar isn't the perfect representation of the core field. It's more like electric currents generating Earth's magnetic field. Still, this model makes it easier to see what's happening to our planet now. The magnetic field of our planet plays an important role in protecting us from dangerous radiation and geomagnetic activity, which is the product of the interaction between the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere. Earth's magnetic field also moves. Scientists have been studying and tracking the movement of the magnetic poles for hundreds of years. The historical motions of these poles indicates changes in the global geometry of the magnetic field of our planet. And they may point to the beginning of the field reversal too. That's what the flip between the north and south magnetic poles is sometimes called. You see, if the north magnetic pole moves a bit, it isn't a big deal. But a complete reversal might have a serious impact on the climate of our planet, as well as modern technology. Luckily, such flips don't happen overnight. The entire process stretches over thousands of years. Plus, even though the magnetic pole weakens during a pole reversal, it doesn't disappear completely. So those scary events from the beginning of the video aren't likely to happen to us. The magnetosphere will continue protecting the planet from cosmic rays and charged solar particles, even though there might be some amount of particulate radiation that will make it to Earth's surface. Magnetic fields are generated by moving electric charges. If some material allows these charges to easily move in it, it's called a conductor. Metal is a great conductor, and we often use it to transfer electric currents from one place to another. In this case, the electric current is negative charges, called electrons, moving through the metal. The current is what generates a magnetic field. Earth has a liquid iron core. In other words, there are layers and layers of conducting material inside our planet. Currents of charges are constantly moving through the core, and the liquid metal is also moving and circulating there, generating the magnetic field. This magnetic field, in turn, produces something resembling a bubble around the planet. It's called the magnetosphere, and it's located above the uppermost part of the atmosphere. This layer shields and deflects high-energy cosmic radiation, which otherwise would be extremely dangerous to people and other forms of life on Earth. The magnetosphere also interacts with the ionosphere, the layer of our planet's atmosphere containing loads of ions and free electrons and capable of reflecting radio waves. The interaction between these two layers and the magnetized solar winds is what scientists call space weather. The solar wind is normally mild, and there's no space weather whatsoever. But sometimes, the sun starts shedding gargantuan magnetized clouds of gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. They're called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. They're ejected from the sun over the course of several hours. CMEs usually look like giant twisted ropes and can occur spontaneously. Their frequency varies according to the 11-year-long solar cycle. For example, at a solar minimum, you can observe one ejection per day. And when the sun is in its most active phase, there might be three CMAs per day. Coronal mass ejections disrupt the calm flow of the solar wind and cause serious disturbances that can damage stuff, both in space near Earth, like satellites, and on the planet's surface. If coronal mass ejections make it to Earth, their interaction with the magnetosphere generates geomagnetic storms. Those can trigger auroras, happening when a stream of energized particles hits the atmosphere and lights up. And then there are also solar flares. They develop more rapidly and with much more energy than coronal mass ejections. Solar flares often occur soon after coronal mass ejections. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. 
Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. A powerful solar storm can potentially cause a devastating global blackout on Earth. If not for the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the sun's activity would be much more devastating. Luckily, the magnetosphere deflects most of the solar material hurtling towards our planet from our star at a speed of over 1 million miles per hour. But even so, during space weather events, there's a lot of hazardous radiation near Earth. It can potentially harm astronauts and spacecraft. Plus, space weather can damage large conducting systems, for example, pipelines and power grids, by overloading currents running inside them. Scientists regularly map and track the overall orientation and shape of our planet's magnetic field. To do it, they use local measurements of the field's orientation and magnitude. That's why they've been able to conclude that the location of the North Magnetic Pole has moved by almost 600 miles since the first measurements were taken in 1831. The magnetic field of our planet reverses on a time scale varying between 100,000 to 1 million years. One can tell how often it happens by looking at volcanic rocks at the bottom of the ocean. They capture the orientation and strength of Earth's magnetic field at the time of their creation. So, dating those rocks gives us a good picture of how our planet's magnetic field has evolved over time. From a geological point of view, field reversals happen quite fast, but they are extremely slow from a human perspective. A complete reversal normally takes a couple of thousand years, but during this time, the orientation of the magnetosphere may shift, exposing more of Earth to cosmic radiation. Such events tend to change the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. In any case, scientists can't say for sure when the next field reversal will happen. But they keep mapping and tracking the movement of our planet's magnetic north. By the way, the Earth isn't the only planet with a magnetic field. Gas giants, like Jupiter, also have a conducting metallic hydrogen layer that generates their magnetic fields. Jupiter's internal magnetic field prevents the solar wind from interacting directly with the planet's atmosphere. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the giant crystal cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. 
They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super-tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now, who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. 
and it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. <laughs>